Welcome back. This section looks at EMS research for the EMT basic. One of the things that's becoming more and more pronounced in our field is the need to determine that there is evidence-based medicine to guide our protocol and how we handle patient encounters to make sure that we have the best uh, patient outcomes. So EMS research is becoming one of those topics that's more and more important for us to at least have a working understanding of at the EMT and the paramedic level because sometimes we're asked to be involved and engaged in that process. This section is on the objectives for the, the course. Take a minute and we will move on. So these are based on national initiatives uh, to feed into this. So we're looking at the Federal Interagency Committee on EMS and their strategic goal is to have data-driven and evidence-based EMS systems that promote improved patient quality care or excuse me care quality. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, has a use of standardization and improvement of EMS data collection such as NEMSIS and then the National Institute of General Medical Sciences and they coordinate the EMS research efforts and promote ideas for research funding and also for collaboration. Now, The practical use of research in EMS is to ensure that the care that we are providing is gleaned from the best, safest possible results in the patient outcomes. It's cares in action, supported by evidence and expert experience and it demonstrates value of EMS care with reportable outcomes. It improves our working conditions and the safety research that can be focused on EMS providers and encourages accurate and complete documentation. So what is research? What does it take to be engaged in a research project? The general level of research is used to collect and analyze information to increase our understanding of a topic or an issue. And in general, these, this includes three very basic steps. And I'm trying to put this in, in a very laid back verbiage to make it easier to kind of understand because it can get very technical uh, when you get into the higher levels of, of research collaboration. So in general you have three points of, of reference. You're going to pose a question, you're going to collect the data to analyze and or, excuse me, collect the data to answer the question and then present an answer to the question that you've asked. So the easiest way to look at this is asking your partner, what do you want for lunch? They collect the data and they say, well, you know, how about going for Chinese? And you say, sure, we haven't ate there at, at that buffet in town recently. So you're presenting an answer to that. That is a very generalized and very basic look at how research is conducted. We do it every day. We just don't realize it. So in general, why should we assist from the field with research? Well, for one, it's going to add to our knowledge and improve our practice because we're going to have new ideas to consider while we do our jobs. And it also informs our policymakers to weigh in on various perspectives over policy debates. Now, I can't just go into the very basic three general steps and not give you the more in-depth version understanding how that scientific method is delivered. So let's look at that. There are two primary research methods that are utilized out there. One is quantitative and the other one is qualitative. The quantitative is when a problem is based on trends in the field and or the need to explain why something occurs and it typically will generate numerical data that can be transformed into usable statistics and this quantifies attitudes, opinions, and behaviors from a larger population to uncover patterns. And then you have qualitative research, and that's to try to gain insight into underlying reasons or opinions and motivations. You're trying to find trends in thought and opinion, and you're really collecting that data through interviews and focus groups. The steps engaged in the scientific method include number one, again, you're asking a question. And then you need to do some 
some some digging. You need to collect or conduct a literature review to try to seek answers to your question. And then you need to determine a hypothesis based on what you've been able to find, test that hypothesis, analyze the data you've collected to either prove or disprove the theory, and there's a section on considering limitations. We'll talk about that. Then you have to report what your findings were, and the best thing is to always repeat your, your research with adjustments or refine the hypothesis based on your original findings. So let's take that scientific method and let's break it down piece by piece and talk about each section so you have a better clarification of how that works. When you're asking a question, you're specifying an issue to study and you're trying to develop some sort of justification as to why it is necessary to study it, suggesting the importance of the study for select audiences. So a good example of this is a research study that I, I performed uh, at the Summit Bechtel Reserve regarding the use of uh, tortol in isolated musculoskeletal injuries. And what we proposed is that the use of Keterolac or tortol in pre-hospital EMS uh, may reduce the need for narcotics based for narcotics to control pain. And what we were looking at is, is it feasible or permittable to allow the EMT basics in West Virginia to utilize intramuscular injections of tortol to reduce the need for narcotics, hopefully and potentially improve outcomes, and be efficient for the use of providers. Once you pose your question and you have your justification for asking, then you need to conduct a literature review. And it's important to know who has studied the research problem you plan to examine. A lot of the common fears among first-time researchers is that they're going to initiate a study that is a replication of some prior research. But our goals is to build upon the existing knowledge and add to those findings on that particular topic. So the biggest thing with literature review is actually locating summaries, books, journals, and index publications on a topic. And you want to summarize, if you're writing this up as a professional level, you want to summarize the literature in a written report. And you want to make sure that whatever literature you are utilizing you want to utilize literature that is reputable. So a good example of this, we go back to my Tordal study. I evaluated publicized studies on pediatric outcomes using Tordal uh, versus those pediatric outcomes where narcotics were utilized to support pain control and then the patients that had both. Uh, reinforce the literature by, re by ensuring quality patient care through researching documents and confirming standards uh, that are nationally recognized for EMS. So what this says is I actually dug around with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and made sure that um, Tordal was recognized and identified for the use of uh, isolated musculoskeletal injuries. Once you've conducted your literature uh, review, you want to determine a hypothesis. And this means you're going to specify your purpose for the research. And you restate the question. You're, you're, you're essentially taking that question you posed, you're restating it and conveying your overall objectives or what the intent of the research is. And typically, that's a combination of not only your question that you posed, but the findings within your literature and how you're going to make it work. So this this hypothesis is going to include the major focus. It's also going to include who your participants are for the study and the location or the site of the inquiry. For us in the Tordal study, it was a controlled setting. We were dealing with um, Boy Scouts that were participating in um, uh, sporting activities at the Summit Bechtel Reserve. So we had a, a controlled group with controlled EMS personnel or responders to that sector that we could m ensure that they had the training they needed to uh, be involved in this research. And that truly is what will happen with you. If you become a participant in a research study, they're going to make sure that you have all of the knowledge you need in order to conduct this study thoroughly and effectively. Otherwise, it, it makes the research um, 
inept. Uh, they have to make sure that you have a full understanding of what you're working with. And then we're going to test the hypothesis. And this is where you're actually collecting the data. There's usually a technical discussion and you're looking at the mechanics and the administration of the data collection and how that's going to work. For me, I utilized a mixed methods approach. And this meant that I'm not only doing a quantitative but also a qualitative research study on tortal administration. So you're going to create and validate your responder qualifications. This is what I was talking about a minute ago. So what we had to do to ensure that we had a set bar across, across the, the entire process is we developed educational classes where we were able to reinforce how to do appropriate IM injections. We reinforced how to ensure BLS skills uh, to reduce pain were done effectively and efficiently. So we look specifically at spinal immobilization and how to isolate, uh, how to do isolated immobilization to maintain and reduce pain from that perspective so that we weren't um, dirtying or sullying the study. Then we look at qualifying incidents through advanced assessment skills. So the, the individuals were taught how to do a musculoskeletal and a neurological evaluation of their patients and then we reviewed how to do quality documentation to ensure that the data that was collected was as pure as it could get. And we developed a method for concisely tracking responses to pain management. We only gave Toradol when there was an initial spank pain scale of five or greater and we did the pain scale assessment very methodically before immobilization, after immobilization, five minutes after Toradol injection, and 15 minutes after the Toradol injection. And then we provided, or we had those EMTs provide detailed documentation of the incident and narrative that included the times and the extraction details so we could make sure, and that's where that qualitative part came in at, so we can make sure that we were addressing all the possibilities. After you've tested your hypothesis and you've got enough data, and typically they like to do uh, groupings of 100 if possible because it's a good solid number, you want to analyze and interpret the data you've collected. And that's where you're sitting down and you're trying to make sense of everything that you've found. And you want to try to draw conclusions. And you also want to keep an eye open for any limitations that were identified during the analysis because it doesn't matter how how much pre-work you do and prep, there's always going to be something you find that you could have done better. So you always want to look for and identify those limitations during the analysis. And then you want to actually report the findings. And this is where you're developing that written report. It's very structured. If you're using the scientific method for research, it's very structured. And it's typically written with the specified reader in mind. So it depends on, remember we talked earlier, you're looking at who that, that group is, that you're, that focus group that you're writing this report for. And you want to evaluate the quality of your research and make sure you own up to those limitations that you identify. So in, in, this, in the Tordal study, there was found a 40% reduction in pain, limitations in final pain scale report from patients after arriving at the receiving facility. Safety precautions at the summit are so successful that there was only 8.6% of patients that required pain management for injuries during the scouting activities. So there wasn't enough incidents to actually warrant policy change at the state level. After you've reported those findings, you actually want to sit down and consider, do we need to repeat the study? Should we refine our hypothesis and make any adjustments to the data collection based on those limitations in order to either further reinforce our findings or maybe look at uh, potentially changing what those findings are? So like I said, in, in our study with the, the Tordal, we didn't have enough patients, um, the, the safety precautions at the scouts were so good that we didn't have enough patients that, that sustained isolated skeletal injuries, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, to warrant uh, any policy change for the state EMTs for you all. Uh, however, we looked at continuing that 
research study into that next summer season to try to get additional numbers and those reports are also in progress so this just kind of give you an understanding of how you want to go about EMS research and your involvement probably is not going to be so much on the writing of the report as it will be uh, being involved or being engaged in the actual collection of the data and this is really important so your your involvement is the the heart and the soul of the entire research project based on what you provide and how careful and the amount of quality you put into your work and, and into the study is really going to have a, a basis for how well that research uh, method is going to be handled and and how well it will be received so if you ever get an opportunity to participate in a research study I strongly encourage you to do it uh, it's an exciting time for EMS we're being looked at as professionals just like nurses and other uh, healthcare fields so uh, this is one step in our uh, adulthood so to speak uh, in a field where we can kind of conduct that research and kind of justify our actions and how we function on a daily basis. So thank you so much for watching this. If you have any questions, as always, uh, reach out to me and we will discuss them uh, at any time. Thank you.